Hello and welcome to the Agora Politics Podcast. This is your host, Alex Mershak. With me today is Mike Elias and James Ellis of ideamarket.io, which is a peer-to-peer zeitgeist management system. Its mission is to replace corporate media as the public's arbiter of credibility, solving what we do call printable credibility. Mike, James, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Alex. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. much. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Um, so, uh, Mike, you are the uh, founder and CEO of Mar- ideamarket.io. Uh, would you mind just briefly introducing the audience to what is the sort of core idea behind Idea Market um, and what it is that you're hoping to solve? Sure. So, as you mentioned, Idea Market aims to replace the arbiter of credibility function typically played by media corporations very poorly with a public marketplace. So in the same way that uh, markets are used to allocate scarce resources like natural resources and commodities and stocks, uh, they can be used to allocate public attention as well. Uh, And given the way that markets are this sort of leaderless mediation mechanism between groups with disparate interests, Uh, We're going to have groups with different propagandistic interests, different ideological interests. It seems like a a reasonable way to solve the same problem. Markets in general have a history of of being uh, a relatively efficient and universally accepted approach to solving this problem. Um, But there's a really specific reason that I wanted to use markets to do it uh, beyond those reasons. And that is... In the internet age, access to the world's best information is no longer a problem. It's not a problem of who has it. Um, There's not really a difference in accessibility between the most obvious, loudest, most authoritative looking information, uh, like CNN, New York Times, whatever, and the best information in the world. These tend to be two completely different categories, and it's not even close but the ease of access is pretty much the same. We have the world's best information lying around on the table like an object, and we're generally not picking it up. We generally don't have mechanisms for the whole world to benefit for from the world's best knowledge. So what we have is not an access problem, it's not a knowledge problem, it's not a discovery problem, it's a curiosity problem. It's that we don't have mechanisms for making people want to seek out this world's best information because there's not really an infrastructure for it. There's not really a reward for it. In fact, our social status hierarchies are set up to punish people who do that and call them conspiracy theorists and crackpots and things like that. So Idea Market is intended to create financial incentives for people to go and pursue this undervalued knowledge in the same way that it could be very financially rewarding to pursue other undervalued things in markets. Does that make sense? Uh, Yes, yes, definitely. Um, One of the questions that I had uh, about sort of the underlying hypothesis here is what do you think uh, is different about the way that ideas have been traditionally propagated? Uh, You mentioned, you know, for example, the news media. that makes it so that certain ideas are essentially improperly priced? Sure. So epistemology for the public generally hasn't changed in thousands of years. Uh, We've always had some authority who was in charge of adjudicating or deciding what that knowledge was and then sort of enforcing it on the public. And if you disagreed too much, you would get kicked out of that public. Um, I, I don't know a lot about the history of of pre-Christian epistemology in in a political sense or anything like that. But you get a sense that the church, as it gained power, became this monolithic authority. And if you disagreed, like Galileo or whatever, you're just like kicked out. You're basically deplatformed. And if you, um, that's probably the best case scenario. You might also be burned as a heretic or something like that. Um, It's basically follows the model of obtain certainty, which does not exist, by the way. So every like obtaining of certainty is is fabricated. It's fake. Manufacture certainty, pretend you have certainty, Mm -hmm. and then enforce it on the public. That's been the two steps. And that continues all the way till now. The scientific um, revolutionaries who 
formed science in the 1700s and 1800s in particular uh, were a, a bit of a deviation from this and that they systematically were kind of rebellious, but even even them, even the history of science is a history of rebellious people. It's not a history of consensus. Um, and now science has been uh, so successful that it's been given the similar sort of monolithic power that the church used to have. And so now of course it's used by power in similar ways to establish uh, a consensus to fake certainty and then enforce it on everyone else. We're seeing the same exact sort of um, knowledge propagation mechanisms that have existed throughout all of human history. And with the internet and especially with crypto, we don't have to use that model anymore. And not only do we not have to, but we never can again, because everyone in the public now has far too much ability to do their own research and to find social support for their own views and to go deep into details on things, um, to need to trust centralized authorities as much as they have in the past. There's just too much decentralization of, of knowledge power now. There's no going back. The, the door has been, been blown open on that model of epistemology. So we need a new way of getting people to agree on things. Um, so a market has a function of allowing everyone's uh, opinions to be heard and registered in a certain way while moderating it sort of naturally in the sense that when you're a market participant, good bets tend to pay better than bad bets. So careful thinking tends to pay better than worse thinking. So it sort of naturally encourages better thinking and discourages worse thinking without having someone sitting at the top going, this is fake, this is real, this is fake, this is real, like we've had for thousands of years. Does that make mm. sense? Yes, certainly. Um, and I guess this is a good place to introduce James. Uh, James, you have been involved sort of in the realm of, let's say, less acceptable or less commonly uh, mainstream held notions for quite a long time uh, with your Hermetics podcast and blog. Um, and I know that as well, you were one of the earliest employees of uh, Idea Market. So if you want to just tell, tell me a little bit about uh, how you got involved, maybe even uh, how uh, you and Mike uh, encountered one another. Sure. I mean, I'm thinking about it now. It's the first time this discussion has really come up with the overlap between Hermetics and Idea Market, which for some reason we've never really discussed, but actually now thinking about it, it's completely apt. So I, I actually discovered Idea Market for, through a friend called Grit Cult, who also works mm -hmm. for Idea Market, and many people will know, who said, these guys are doing this cool thing, you should head on over and um, got myself listed and loved the idea. Um, and we can get into the functionality of Idea Market, of course. Uh, and then saw that Mike was sort of the, at that point expanding the team. And I said, well, let's do a podcast. And of course, um, my own podcast, Hermetics, basically deals with the this exact same social and historical phenomena which Idea Market is dealing with, which is uh, there is a ton of information about. So if I step back a bit, when I was doing my master's in continental philosophy, there was like in the in the course of the term or the, the time I was in it, you deal with like six to eight big name philosophers that people would know about. And you'd be reading these really interesting books and they'd be citing all these other figures from history. And there'd be these footnotes that you'd follow and you'd be like, man, this guy seems really, this guy seems really interesting. And then you'd head on over and there'd be a wiki page, right? Or there would be stuff about him or this person. And you'd be like, wow, this person's written like 20 books in, you know, whatever time. And you're like, where have they what's happened where have they gone the information's here so it's exactly the same thing of you know that huxley quote of the future's here it's not evenly distributed it's like the knowledge is here it's just not evenly distributed everything's out there so that was what i was trying to do and still i'm trying to do with hermetics is saying like move away from these big thinkers because there's there's a ton of interesting stuff out there which in its day probably was super super popular and and to be honest i i don't think there's always an agenda with these things i think a lot of things just fall out of favor just because that happens a lot of this is fashion um and so really you know i wanted to move the the the, the form and style and ideas of the podcasting that i've i've been doing over to uh we could say the contemporary online sphere of there is all right there's joe rogan all right there's eric weinstein there's these big names but 
like if you spend some time on Twitter, if you spend some time in the spheres of these people, you realize there is, and I mean this in, in with no amount of like uh, hyperbole. I mean this seriously. There is literal geniuses out there with blogs of like 300 followers. And I don't mean literal geniuses who you're like, you, you, you're like, you know, some guy be like, oh, dude, read my blog on this. And you're like, where, where, you know, what's going on? And this is what I, I think at first saw the mechanism of IDMARC to be is like, these guys almost need like a jump start. It's like, it's not for lack of ability. It's not for lack of talent. It's not for lack of sincerity. It's for that exact same reason that many of the thinkers that I tackle on hermetics, it's like, it just happened that way. And it's the ability to go, I believe in this person. I believe in this idea. I believe in this wiki page. I believe in this blog. I'm going to back it. I'm going to put it up the rankings because I believe this is credible information, which, you know, and here's basically, I guess, in the shortest way possible to say what idea market does in this sense is it just allows me to put that idea that I believe in in front of people's eyes as a, as a, as a, as quickly as possible. And uh, so, yeah, like there was a complete synthesis in what I've always believed in and what Mike's like built. So yeah, that's the long story of it all. Well, that's, that's very cool. I'm surprised that hasn't been brought up before. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems to me like, you know, you explore issues like collapse and occultism, uh, acceleration, uh, these sorts of things, which, you know, don't really get a lot of mainstream play, but of course have like a rich intellectual history. Um, and for some reason, you know, they sort of go by the wayside. Um, I want to get it now into a little bit of the nuts and bolts because we've talked about some of the changes that idea market uh, might be able to create and how it might even fund uh, individuals, as you pointed out, James. Um, so uh, if you would, please, either of you can uh, take this one. Uh, we could get a little bit more into what is the exact funding mechanism? Um, how is it that an individual who's participating in idea market uh, might back specific creators and what are the benefits for um, the people who are getting, uh, or I guess, uh, the beneficiaries of this, uh, this funding? Sure. So there are two ways to, to make money with Idea Market. One is as a purchaser of tokens for a listing. If you put your money behind something to say, I believe more people should see this, I'm betting that more people will bet even further that more people need to see this. If you make good bets and people buy after you, then you can sell and get capital gains in the same way that you can buy low, sell high, any other kind of asset. Um, so that's the, the simplest way. That's the uh, end user way. When we are curating social media accounts or things that are definitely tied to an individual or a person, um, Twitter accounts are the best example or Substack accounts, then the money that goes into the market um, is held in a bonding curve. So mm -hmm. I, should, I should explain the details of, of exactly how this market functions because it's not like NASDAQ. It's not like a stock market where there's uh, two-sided liquidity and, you're, and it's like a constant eBay auction between buyers and sellers. It doesn't actually work like that. When you create a listing on idea market, what you're doing is creating a bonding curve. And a bonding curve is like a digital vending machine that spits out tokens in proportion to how many are being bought. And it automatically manages the price. So it has this weird function of, you can simultaneously bring more into existence and have the price goes up. So you, the, the price is managed in proportion to supply by a predetermined algorithm. And that's the same, it's the same for every single listing. Um, their bonding curves are notoriously hard to explain. So I'll pause here and just see if that kind of makes sense at base at first pass there? Um, yeah, so, so my understanding is basically, you know, if I, uh, I get a certain amount of tokens uh, that I allocate to, let's say my top five, uh, let's just call them creators. Yeah. Um, and uh, because those tokens are allocated to them, they're earning a certain amount of interest uh, through the compound protocol. Yes, I haven't gotten to that yet. I wanted oh, okay. to explain where, where the money goes first, but yes, exactly. Um, the, the bonding curve just makes it so that you can list something obscure and you don't have to have a counterparty in order to trade it. Mm -hmm. You can be the first person to the thing. You buy right from the vending machine. If you, don't, if you change your mind, you can sell right back to the vending machine. You don't have to have like a liquidity provider on the other side. You don't have to solve the two-sided market problem. 
for really obscure things, which mm -hmm. a lot of idea market listings are going to start out as really obscure things. Um, so yes, uh, the bonding curve is managed. By, it's, a, it's a smart contract that mints tokens in proportion to how they're bought. Um, and in the meantime, that means when you buy tokens on idea market, the money doesn't go to me. It doesn't go to us. It doesn't go to the company. It doesn't go to a person. It gets held in the bonding curve as like a backing deposit for the tokens that you bought so that when you cash out, you can get that money back adjusted for profit and loss. Um, and the money that's held in the bonding curve, the money that comes from all the purchases of a token gets lent out of an interest bearing protocol on the back end so that all those deposits in aggregate for any particular listing earn interest. Then that interest is paid to the person who owns the, the listing, what the listing represents. So if you're buying the listing for, you know, Balaji Srinivasan's Twitter account or something like that, and Balaji gets a million dollars of deposits in there. That million dollars will be earning maybe fifty to hundred thousand dollars a year in interest. And Balaji can, can just come by and pick that up. He can just come by and cash that check, no questions asked. He doesn't have to really do anything else. He can just he can just receive it. So this is a new income stream based on the trust and confidence you inspire in your audience, as measured in skin in the game as measured in capital risk without any ads, without any paywalls. It's really just um, completely in proportion to market, market confidence um, from anybody. Um, the, that mechanism is paused right now because we did a major technical upgrade and there are other parts of the ecosystem that has to catch up. So interest isn't being accrued at this exact moment but we're uh, looking to plug back into that ASAP. But that's, that's, that's one of the novel parts there. Hmm. Uh, so James, uh, I wanted to ask you, have you claimed, uh, have you, I, I'm assuming the answer to this is yes. Uh, you, are you verified uh, on, on the idea market for your own, um, I, got, I guess, intellectual properties? Yeah, I got two verifications on there. So the Meta Nomad Twitter account and the Hermetics podcast uh, Twitter account are the two verifications. I haven't actually done my Substack yet, which it could be another thing like for the sake of it. But those two are verified on there. And I think there's um there's a fair bit in both at the moment so actually both are like making wood like my interest would on them is like 20 30 dollars a year which mm. doesn't seem like a lot but in it, it it's uh it's a really innovative way to support a creator because i'm trying to put this in a way in terms of your investment in a creator in terms of the long term someone you believe in if 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 for instance, uh, 10,000 people do $30 once and there's $300,000 in there and the interest rate on that is let's just say 10%. Mm. That creator has then got $30,000 a year and these people never have to pay in again, right? They, they, their support is there. That creator has then basically got an income stream, like a serious income stream so it's an extremely innovative way to do that but it's also a way simultaneously to you know because one thing i guess that wasn't mentioned in the practical thing which is like a lot of people get the practical side of things very quickly like in abstract yes your twitter account your Substack account your showtime account uh and soon to be your minds.com account uh all four of these and and we'll get to the other thing which is slightly different in a bit but all four of these um, can be can, can be backed by that same function, and that's very very easy to understand. Of course, the question that most people that I think we should tackle now, really, because it's the question that so many people ask, even when it's explained, is okay, I get it, but why would I want to do that? So I would just like what we were reiterating at the start. If you think about that mechanism of what we've just explained about how idea market practically works. In the process of that mechanism, in the process of quite literally skin in the game, monetarily backing an account, which is quite literally in a certain sense, uh, you, you, you are saying, look, what this account is doing is really, really interesting to the point that I want to put money behind it, um, which, which in the future may allow, may allow you to sell at a higher, higher rate in terms of the bonding curve, et cetera. Mm. You are making a social an online, a network signal by that action to say, 
this this thing needs to be bigger. This thing should be bigger. More eyes should be on this thing. More attention should be on this thing, which is why one of our slogans is where attention pays you. Because if you're paying attention to what's going on online, if you're finding amazing blogs, sources, Twitter accounts who are really, um, like I was saying earlier about these unique Twitter accounts that you follow and you're like, wow, this guy's just done a 70 tweet thread, like <laughs> disseminating, you know, big government or something that's the most unique thing you've ever read. And there's, he's got a thousand followers. You're, you're then given this option to say, no, this guy's going to be huge in the future. I want to get in before everyone else. So the why is quite literally the market of the marketplace of ideas, right? The why is I can sort of profit from being first, from being right, from wanting to be right. I can profit from wanting the truth to be given a better platform, right? Um, so that it, Mike, do you think that's a good way to explain the why? How would you explain why should I why should I list? Why should I buy? Uh, you know, it's the big question. Yeah, I, I definitely say that's fair. I would just add the sort of cultural context being there's so much intellectual frustration right now, like pretty much no matter what you believe, you feel unheard. There's not a single demographic out there that's like, yeah, my voice is getting out there enough. Yeah, I feel represented. Everyone is just like, X is holding me down and my truth is being denied and like people aren't listening to me. Everyone feels unheard. Mm. And part of that is, is the limitations of the, you know, very tightly gate kept institutional, you know, narrative, narrative control cartel complex. Um, and what we've built is intended to be a lifeboat out of that in the same way that people you know, recognize the limitations and, and power abuses of the federal bank uh, or federal, uh, excuse me, uh, central bank and are using Bitcoin to escape that system into one that functions entirely differently and has no dependency on it. Um, Idea market is intended to be the same sort of lifeboat for the legacy media and social media culture. So every time, you know, the New York Times blows a story or whatever your favorite enemy is gets too much attention or whatever your favorite viewpoint gets suppressed unfairly or something like that. Um, we are trying to build a place that is obviously the thing to do in response. Just a lightning rod for all that frustration to express itself in a way that it has no other means of, of doing so. Um, there's, there's just no other tool like this. So to the extent that we can um, successfully be that lifeboat for people, we can give people not only the financial incentive to be first, but also the activist incentive to be effective and to get satisfaction for their natural curiosities and beliefs. Mm. So if I'm an individual uh, and I'm looking at ideamarket.io um, and I would say I just pick, uh, you know, I, I, I decide, I think uh, Balaji is undervalued I think uh, Eric Weinstein, for example, is undervalued, right? And Agreed. That, I love both those guys. And and the thing I'm 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 questioning is, am I betting on that individual's ideas themselves, or am I betting instead on sort of their prominence or their growth as as an influencer? Um, how do you view sort of trying to untangle those two? Sure. Um, I. James, if you have something to say, I've, 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 I'd love to hear you, but I'll, I'll just handle this first real quick. Okay. Um, the idea market is heavily inspired by Reddit. I love Reddit. I love the way that it's able to take obscure things and make them global overnight just by popular vote, basically. The problem is all that power uh, was you know, too centralized, too inexpensive, too heavily moderated and administrated and is very easily controlled. So we've replaced the upvote system with a market system. And what's special about that is the allocation of attention. So in the most pure sense, what we are hoping idea market gets used for is just to sort by attention worthiness mm. and let people decide what that means to them. And instead of trying to decide what's true on people's behalf, like the past 5,000 years of epistemology, we're trying to solve for attention worthiness as a proxy for truth, because 
once you know that something is false, it becomes boring. Lies are just boring. You don't listen to them after you know they're lies. So by solving for attention worthiness, you kind of inadvertently, indirectly solve for truth as a side effect without having to define truth really, really well, which is not possible. And even if you could, you couldn't get consensus on it. So why bother? So uh, it's a market for attention worthiness uh, in, in that that's the goal anyway. But the question does remain, how do you disentangle mere popularity from truth or idea value? And the answer to that is history is full of high stakes situations. And the future is full of high stakes situations like COVID, like election crises, like um, meteors coming, like reptile overlords, like UFOs, like whatever might be true. There are high stakes situations where everyone in the world goes, oh, this could really affect me. This could affect my family. This could affect my income. This could affect something. There's, and in those high stakes situations, people have a genuine need for genuine information and they clamor for it. And that, that's the necessary and appropriate response. High stakes situations force people to care about the truth more than in other situations. Kittens, Justin Bieber, etc., quickly become very boring when the question is, am I gonna survive another year? And since history is continuing to throw surprises at us and there's no reason it should ever stop, people will continue to have reasons to pursue the truth and separate what is good and useful and credible from what is merely entertaining or popular. Hmm. And uh, James, did you have any thoughts on that? Uh, you well, know, I was, I, go ahead. You asked about, you know, is it, is it the person we're backing or is it their ideas? And I'm just thinking back in time to, there was plenty of accounts um curtis yarvin is probably one of the biggest examples um a lot, a lot of other people in that sphere uh i'm trying to think of who who's the the rationalist who got no, scott alexander scott alexander people who basically were like i'm just gonna write right they're like i'm just gonna write stuff and it didn't matter to them whether or not they actually got attention and it just so happened that their ideas were like so unique, were so good, were so er erudite, articulate that they got attention because the ideas were right. But that doesn't really mean that they get the, the attention that one could argue they deserved or that that information was in the right place or it was being seen by the right you know, people in a, certain, in a certain way. So in the sense of are you backing their ideas or are you backing the person, I'd say that's sort of like a, a feedback loop in a way, right, that those two things are sort of together. Like the ideas are going to push the popularity, but the popularity is simultaneously going to push the ideas. But I would also say like, in terms of the fact of our name idea market, hmm. I would, I think I would say that the ideas are first. And that's sometimes the, the sad thing in a way, because an idea doesn't have its own legs. Like hmm. an idea can't move itself, right? An idea is just an idea. So you need these functions to be able to say, here's what we can do with it. Here's more, more people should know about this, um, et cetera. Yeah, and I think there's an, there's an optimistic side to that too, which is nobody can be an expert in everything. So inevitably we all have to trust someone. And in that sense, on the individual personal curation layer, we're deciding who to trust because we can't always take the time to figure out what the reality is. Sometimes we have to act fast. If, the, if, a, virus, if a new virus is gonna be here in a week, we don't have the time to wait 30 years to see what was really going on with it and then act. We have to kind of assess things now. So we have to decide whose judgment has been good in the past, who has been honest in the past, who can we trust? And that's, a, that's not at the idea level, that is at the person level. Um, so that there's absolutely a, a fundamental use case for that as well. Uh, it's, not, it's not merely about soulless egreg egregores. Yeah. So in a way, I'm sort of outsourcing my individual sense making to this trusted individual, right, who has been reliable, who has shown themselves to have uh, good judgment and to be truthful. And I'm saying I'm betting on this individual to continue being that way into the future because of their prior track record. Right. And actually, in a way, individuals are somewhat more reliable than um, I guess, large, large institutions would be right. So they say for like stock markets, for example, you know, 
Uh, past history does not guarantee future returns, something like that. Um, but with individuals, it's actually very different because the unit of account is not this large uh, inhuman structure, the egregor, as you as you said, but actually it's just it's just one person, right? And if that person is someone of integrity, quite literally, they're integrated well, um, then you would expect that to continue out into the future unless some sort of anomalous um, thing happens, like you find out that you know their entire career has been a lie or or something crazy like that, and they just trash their credibility overnight. Now, certainly that could happen, but also that individual if they are in the process of, let's say, ascending, gaining a reputation, they have a high degree of cost that would be associated with despoiling that in any way. Um, mm -hmm. And so you could see how this, uh, to me, it, it's, this is so magical because, you know, if it works, you're basically aligning so many things. And while we have said, you know, it is true that in some ways this is only a proxy for certain ideas, right? These individuals, um, it, it is probably attentional share is probably like the most reliable thing. Um, and the other thing I like about it too is that it's not, it's not simply based on pre-existing popularity. You're like, how big are you right now? As so many other aspects of social media are. Um, it's actually based, it, it actually creates this whole incentive structure around finding what is undervalued. Uh, which I think is like rather unique. A lot of other things in social me in the social media world are really based upon who's already you know achieved some some measure of value, whether that's through their online work or through their work uh, offline that sort of translates into online popularity. Um, sort of all of those things that are already let's say discovered, there's not a lot of additional value to gain. And so really, what you're doing is you're I mean this is I know I'm reiterating points that you've said already. But this is just so exciting to me uh, when it when it starts clicking. And I hope for those listening that is clicking for you as well, um, how much potential there is here for, uh, you know, just the improvement of our knowledge ecosystems and also the improvement of uh, very tangibly of people's lives. Uh, James, as you pointed out, this could be a real avenue for creators of all kinds and even intellectuals um, to basically supplement or even in some cases maybe um you know become entirely their their income um by just continuing to put out uh i i, I don't like to use this phrase because it's so overused but good content uh mm. it doesn't necessarily have to be that right uh i saw that like the top uh, person on um uh ideamarket.io is Elon Musk. And of course, he's not really a creator in the sense of he's, you know, doing a blog or a podcast or anything like that. He's obviously doing uh, very uh, tangible things um, in business and in, uh, in technology. Uh, and yet that's someone obviously that, that everyone is, is interested in continuing to, you know, invest in uh, for his future potential. Um, and so that's, that's uh, really cool as well. It doesn't have to be this sort of, it, it's not, I guess, it's important in this discussion to keep in mind that it's, this is not limited to simply those of us who are in the creator economy. For this example. is, well, this is, this is one thing. I mean, I just wanted to add in a couple of, couple of things. I mean, one thing you said there was, if it works, I just want to add that it's already working. Right? Mm. Uh, I just want to add that in. But the, the big thing, um that i want to say in terms of what you you know because there was this there is this sort of if if you just listen to the what we've spoken about now there would you might i would understand that you might get the impression that it is just individuals so i would reiterate that it's twitter accounts it's mm. substack blogs right it's showtime accounts and minds.com accounts and as we know like there's twitter account there, there can be a twitter account for anything Right, because it can a Twitter account but can become anything. A Substack blog can be on anything. I mean, if someone wants to put a million pounds behind a gardening blog and they think that's the truth we need to know about, then ultimately they've made that signal. But one mm. thing that's sort of beautiful about the mechanism, which which you know inherently reveals something else that idea I, I, is uh, yeah once again inherently built into idea market is not so much an antagonistic relationship with uh, mainstream media. But um, a a sort of a nudging, right? Like, uh, all right, well, let's see what you've got. And for instance, one question, which um, one thing that I said to Mike really on, early on, which I loved about the idea of listing, is all the people that say watch BBC on a daily 
day, on, on on every day, Fox News, CNN. The question of would they back that company with money if they were given the option? And I would I would argue the answer is absolutely no. You just wouldn't. You you've never thought actually. Do I seriously believe the things these people are saying to the point where I'd go, yeah, I'll put ten dollars behind them to put them up the rankings? I don't think so. I don't think any of these people would. And so, in building this mechanism, mainstream media have to up their game because they're now competing on the the the. the you could say that the entire media landscape has been imminentized. It's like right, you're on the same level now, right? You've all got the same uh, financial functionality to put yourself up the rankings, right? If you if 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 you're honest, if you're sincere, if you back truth, then you'll probably go up the rankings because people will, will like you. But if you continue what you if you continue to do what you've been doing for the last 20 years, which is basically just pander to the crowd and say say polite nothings all the time, then no one's going to back you. So yeah. it, it it just immediately puts everyone on the same playing field. And as I say, it's not a hostile relationship to them, but they are going to understand that as antagonistic because we're finally like they're saying that they're saying the truth. And I think every it, such functions as idea make it just make it like we didn't mean to, but we've made it transparent that you're not really doing your job. Right. Like yeah. it, we didn't really mean to do that. But the fact is that our function has revealed that. Sorry to say. Yeah. I mean, uh, those news organizations are up there uh, on the chart and you can see, you know, where NPR is ranked and uh, some of the others. And, uh, you know, it, it is interesting that you point out that it's not merely adversarial, but it actually is a nudge to get them to, uh, to, to, to be better. Right. Uh, you know, uh, Mike, you've got your little, uh, your, your shirt on the New York times, mm. uh, you know, and I think that really, uh, puts it very succinctly that you're sort of teasing them, right? Like, uh, you know, improve yourselves. You're telling people not to go down the rabbit hole, but maybe there's gold at the bottom of the rabbit hole. Um, so, you know, who knows what you might find if you are willing to look in uh, unusual places. Um, one of the things that I found interesting about this solution as well, which is a very Web3 um, characteristic, which is that... Uh, the things that you're investing in, as you said, uh, James, it's not merely individuals themselves. Uh, it could just be a, an account, right? Something like the Grit Cult account, you know, which may or may not be an individual or a group of individuals. Anyway, well, soon, um, soon it could be even more than that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who knows what it really is? Well, Mike, should, I mean, I feel like we should probably talk about the Wikipedia stuff just to. Yeah, I, I want I want to know where Alex is going with this, but okay, yeah. Sorry. Well, uh, so I'll just I'll just finish this, and then we can get into your, the Wikipedia thing in a moment. Um, which is that these can be anonymous, right? And uh, and so this entire uh, funding scheme, uh, and I don't mean scheme in a negative connotation, just you know, descriptively, uh, can uh, be investing in individuals who you don't know at all. And there's no issues with like uh, with KYC or any other compliance concerns, because unlike uh, other, you know, protocols, it, it my understanding is at least, you know, as long as they're verified through you as the uh, rightful owner of that property, then they are, uh, you know, eligible to receive the benefits of that interest. And so there doesn't need to be a de-anonymizing either. Uh, for for the customer, for, not the customers, but for the investors or for uh, the individuals that could benefit. Agreed. Yeah, um, that is that's all by design. And there are going to be options for people to reveal various amounts about their identities just to to distinguish themselves from bots that are being manipulated by George Soros or whatever <laughs> uh, down the line. But that's always going to be optional. All right. So uh, what what is going on with this new Wikipedia thing? So let's let's get into that, because I think uh, this really strikes at sort of the heart of, you know, the more general epistemological problems that might be solved by this. If you're talking about a, a repository of knowledge that's done in an open source distributed way, uh, finding a way to deal with Wikipedia, for example, uh, would be, you know, top of the list. Sure. So. A little backstory to tie the social accounts to the Wikipedia accounts, and that is when building Idea Market, one of the most challenging questions that we've had to figure out is how do you codify an idea? 
how do you decide where an idea or a piece of information begins and ends? And the account listings were just one way of solving this. It's each account represents what this person has said here. It's like a collection of their previously published work. It, it provides a way to delineate where ideas begin and end. All of the things that Balaji's posted, that's Balaji's account, right? Um, so that's just a way of solving the idea codification problem using social accounts as a proxy for the previous published work of each person. It's a categorization mechanism. The Wikipedia market is just a different answer to that same question. They, being an encyclopedia, have already built an idea codification system of their own in pages. They have a page that addresses a thing and links to other pages. So we're just piggybacking on the idea codification system that they've built out in order to allow people to surface ideas and concepts in the abstract directly without going through a social account as a proxy. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's the super boring technical philosophical part of it. Um, the exciting part of it is um, what we're really asking is what should the whole world be Googling right now? And if it has a Wikipedia page, it can be an answer. And if you look back at you know, the GameStop phenomenon, for example, where you'd had millions of uh, retail investors piling into something on the stock market, just uh, largely in order to send a message, largely in order to just say, I'm here, I'm tired of your shenanigans, uh, just, just to be heard on this institutional level that tends to ignore the public voice in so many ways. Um, the challenge with that is it, it works spectacularly. The problem is Wall Street isn't built for being a conduit for messages. It's not built for communicating. So all that could be communicated with something very vague like FU Wall Street. Rah, I'm angry Wall Street. You know, like there's, there's a very low res signal. By contrast, idea market in this Wikipedia market specifically is designed to send messages. So if you think something like the Geese Lane Maxwell trial is really important and it's not getting any attention, well, you can buy the Geese Lane Maxwell Wikipedia page up the rankings and use money to force that into public discourse in the same way that GameStop did that without any particular goal. So um, that kind of goes back to the lightning rod analogy that people, if they feel something, a topic uh, is not adequately addressed, they have a way of, of putting that precise thing into the Overton window without trusting any third parties or media corporations or getting permission from anybody. Mm. And, that's, and that's like, is it 54 million Wikipedia articles? Something like that, but only, yeah. a, only a fraction of those are in English. Six. Um, all right. All right. You got six yeah. million options. Yeah. 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 For yeah. you. And also the the Epstein didn't kill himself meme has its own Wikipedia page. So mm. like not just not just Epstein, but the phrase Epstein didn't kill himself has a Wikipedia page and therefore can be a listing. And you know, there's a, there's a lot of meme potential there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I think one of the other things too about this is it allows sort of a, uh, uh, I don't want to. This, I, I don't want to use this term derogatorily, but sort of a populist uh, assertion of the will for attention, right? Um, so I know for actually both of you um, from, uh, you know, doing, uh, doing research ahead of this conversation, that both of you have sort of uh, found your own way to various kinds of traditions as of late, um, and, uh, we don't necessarily need to get into that, although, uh, feel free to talk about it if you'd like, but, uh, one of the things that's interesting about sort of tradition and the way that it gets sort of disparaged, uh, often by some of these mainstream sources that we're talking about these days is that, uh, the reason why traditions, uh, last, the reason why they are traditions is because they have continued to prove, uh, true over long stretches of time, right? During good times and bad. Uh, during lots of different situations. And so uh, forgive the, uh, the Taleb term, uh, there's sort of a Lindy effect, right? That uh, these, let's say, institutions or ideas or concepts uh, or mores have 
And their way, the reason they're kept around is simply because they have proven themselves useful. Um, and so I view this, uh, this general concept of funding particular ideas, specifically when you're talking about like the Wikipedia page or certain creators or certain institutions, um, as another way to sort of reassert the importance of perhaps some things that have been disregarded, uh, uh, wantonly disregarded or uh, undervalued because of sort of fashionable things, right? One of the things that's interesting about this concept is that the things that are true, even if they're unfashionable right now, which uh, according to idea market would mean that they're undervalued, um, will eventually win out, right? The truth does will out. So, uh, I mean, what are your thoughts? Uh, feel free to take this, uh, James or, or Mike, um, <laughs> on sort of what this might do to kind of reinvigorate the, I guess, public sentiment around traditional values or traditional mores or tr even traditional institutions. I'm happy to go deep on any of this stuff. James, if you have something to say, I'd happy um, to let you go first. Okay. Well, I was going to say, I mean, tradition, traditions... Um a funny word and people get funny about it. I mean, I've heard it described as a tool, like a toolbox, right? You handed down tools, which basically shorten your time frame to have to learn lessons, which may take years and years to learn, right? And it was an interesting conversation I had with someone the other day, actually about tradition. And tradition is sometimes like sitting at the tradition of stopping at a red light in your car, even though there is nothing else coming at any of the other junctions you're like god why do we still why am i doing this right why and it's like yeah fine you can risk it you you, you could you could try risk it but seriously you're gonna end up in a big mess if if when when if you like that is the best metaphor i've sort of found for it because like it doesn't always make sense but these are the, these are things which have been handed down for so long which basically mean you don't have to learn the hard lessons right you don't have to learn to not put your hand in the fire to know you get burnt. it's like if you do this thing, it's really going to suck. Well, how do you know? Like, I know because like my grandparents tried and failed and that's what tradition is. That's all tradition is really. I mean, you have ritual traditions, you have things like that, which may be spiritual or esoteric. And that's a little bit different, but tradition really is basically like someone a long time ago learned a hard lesson. So you don't have to, and you don't have to pay the cost to learn that lesson. That's the big deal, which means you get to start from like the higher basis so you don't have to expend a ton of energy making mistakes. And that's really the, the basis of tradition is you get to make, you get to not make 10,000 years worth of mistakes. Mm. And when you disobey, well, not, I don't want to say disobey, but when you go, ah, stuff tradition, it's like, all right, well, well done putting yourself 10,000 years ago. And when you get to about 60 or you know, 50 or 60, you're like, man, I wish I'd listened. Right. And that's, that's tradition. That's, and that's the tradition of tradition is that, you know, that's that's all it is. I mean, that's all I really have to say about tradition. And I think, in a way, that I, I, idea market is really covering that because we're just bringing things to the fore. You know, we're bringing the re. I guess we're bringing back some of the reasons maybe people you might here's why you may want to stop at a traffic light. It's become so fashionable to not stop at the red light, and it's like actually a lot of people are getting in car wrecks, which you aren't seeing. Here's some reasons why. I mean, I'm stringing out this metaphor, but mm. I there is a connection. But I uh, yeah, Mike. Yeah. No, I like that. I hadn't thought of it that way. But it's funny that you use that metaphor because that is one of the most annoying things in the world to me. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I, yeah. Um, we'll talk about that more later. But uh, yeah, the one of one of the things Idea Market has the potential to do um, that's new is to provide a an honest faith dashboard of public belief. That right now, if you have to, if you want to know what does the public really believe in value, there's no way to directly know that. You have to go through a media corporation or a social media corporation or a polling company or an election company. There are all these centralized intermediaries to answer that question. But if this is answered using a public decentralized marketplace, then there can be a signal directly from the public to itself about what it really values. So to the extent that tradition um, still has a lot of interest and values uh, and emotion and weight behind it, if culture doesn't reflect that, then it's just gonna send a distorted signal back to us. Um, but I think there's actually a lot more vigor 
in traditional values right now than mainstream culture would have us believe. And to the extent that idea market uh, reaches more demographics, well, I think we'll see that reflected and people will be able to see, oh yeah, this actually is a real force in the world still. It's not, we're not actually living in the Hollywood world of relativism. Mm. One of the things that's uh, interesting to me about the potential for idea market and perhaps it's being used in this mode already is that it's not simply the uh, one-sided angle of, oh, I think this idea is going to be important or this person or concept is going to be important. Therefore, I'm going to put put uh, basically an investment into its future importance, um, but also sort of the uh, reflexive angle where uh, especially once idea market is at a massive scale, uh, you could essentially have people looking at idea market in order to evaluate, uh, you know, the um, the relevance of certain individuals, the relevance of certain topics. You've already, you know, uh, alluded to this a little bit with with the Wikipedia Ghislaine Maxwell example, um, but I think that's just an interesting uh, feedback that we should take note of, which is that the tool is not simply a one sided tool for making money off of. Uh, you know, things that you think you're right about, right? It's also mm -hmm. this, it, it also will service this, this other side of things, which I think really brings the, um, the epistemological mission full circle um, of sort of feeding back on people's individual perceptions of what ideas, what individuals, what concepts are worth valuing, right? Because it's we're all feeding off of one another, right? There's something there's something key to draw on there actually. I mean, one of the one of the other statements that we've come up that Mike's come up with at Idea Market is make lying expensive, right? So you you said there this idea of people saying, I think this, I think that, right? Idea market saying, Do you though? Like, do, are you willing to put your money on the line? Like, are you willing to back this person? And uh, so all of a sudden, I think you'll find that. A lot of people, when they say, I think, I believe, I trust, I, 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 when it comes to the moment where there's actually some cost, risk uh, on the line, they suddenly don't. And in, in that sense, making lying expensive is, all right, so your account's doing well, people are, people are putting a lot of money behind you, the credibility's rising. All of a sudden, someone actually can't act like the BBC. They can't act like the mainstream media who might turn on a dime because someone else is in power or because someone else has paid them a bit of money, maybe to say something. They can't do that because their credibility and everything else is is on the line. So they, they you know, they say the whole idea of like, well, I think this actually is, is almost meaningless mm. until there is some stakes in the game. Right. Until there is some stake of something at stake saying I think is, well, OK, good for you. You know, well. What, what can I do with that? Yeah. Preference falsification is rampant. So, <laughs> you know, what you exactly. think, what, what is that worth? Mm. <clears throat> uh, all right. Well, uh, I think we're close to the end of our time here. So I want to thank both of you uh, so much for coming on. Uh, for those listening, I hope you will go uh, look at ideamarket.io and check it out and put some money on the top things that you think are important and that should get more attention. Um, that being said, before I let you two go, I have uh, one final question for each of you, which is, uh, who are your top three <laughs> accounts uh, that you would invest in, uh, or perhaps that you are invested in, uh, on ideamarket.io that you think people should be paying more attention to? On the day Idea Market launched, I bought five accounts, uh, but the one that's, that I'll mention most quickly is Brian Romley. Ryan Romley is a Twitter guy who has probably over 100,000 followers, and he posts uh, a lot of very credible UFO knowledge and advanced technology knowledge that uh, I'm not even sure where he gets it, but he's posted foot footage of astronauts saying, oh yeah, aliens are totally real. Like this is Gordon Cooper, guy walked on the moon and he's like, oh yeah, we saw all these aliens, we saw, or we saw these UFOs, I think they're not from Earth. We've talked about it. They don't want us to talk about it. Um, and there's just an incredible high, you know, high signal coming from from his Twitter account that I really appreciate. And um, so he he was one of the first ones that I bought. James, uh, 
one's unfortunately it's, he's no longer there so I, can't, I shouldn't really mention it but one was my, uh, michael burry uh so michael j burry who was a big short guy found out all that another one for me would be grimhood mm. uh anyone who knows grimhood doing the nutrition stuff i mean that's it's one of the best use cases for idea market in a way is because it's something you don't think about like almost like deep nu- deep nutrition right like i don't know esoteric yeah. nutrition you don't think about it um, a whole rabbit hole yeah, and obviously Hermetics, Hermetics podcast, right? That's pretty, mm. pretty good. Yes, yeah. yes, of course. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Go check out Hermetics. Um, well, <laughs> that, that that being said, uh, I thank you so much for coming on once again. Um, I really appreciate it, and I want to encourage everyone that's listening to uh, to go down some rabbit holes yourselves. Uh, can we just say that IdeaMarket.io and our Discord is uh, completely public and open? Jump in, like everyone, we're all there to answer questions about. Because we know it's quite technical at times. Oh, yeah. And, and if you want this forward. t-shirt, you can get one too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so jump you... in. We're always 24-7. We're there to give you advice and feedback and stuff. All right. Uh, so uh, Mike uh, is at Twitter at uh, Harmony Lion one uh, James is at Twitter at uh, MetaNomad. Uh, the website is ideamarket.io. Thank you so much. And uh, it was great, great talking to you guys. Thank you, Alex. I had fun. Thanks, man. All right. See ya. See ya.